Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. We're approaching the holidays, the Thanksgiving and Passover, Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas and all the different uh, disciplines seem to want to turn towards the light as, as it gets darker. Uh, and the holidays can certainly be a time of joy. I sense a certain elation among people as I go out in public now, as we slowly uh, come out of the seclusion of COVID, which is not over yet. Um, but the holidays can also be a time of darkness and of chronic and not very helpful introspection, you know, a time of high hopes and dashed ex expectations and <laughs> disappointment and fatigue and I don't know about you, but sometimes we find ourselves tiptoeing across the minefield of family get-togethers. You know, uh, a lot comes up for people around the holidays, and I think it's just at such times that our Buddhist practice can support us. Uh, some of our old patterns, our hurt feelings, our dashed expectations can contribute to this vague feeling of unease and disappointment. I think around the holidays and. We carry, uh, we carry the karma of our family with us. And I think it stands out in sharp relief sometimes during the holidays, as happy as we can be to get together with people we love. Um, and I think one thing that comes up when we gather in groups is uh, we might be comparing ourselves to others, you know. Um, to our friends, to our family members, wondering how they see us, maybe noticing ourselves, judging them in certain ways. And it made me start thinking about where do we get our sense of self-worth? You know, where does that come from? Does it come from our families, from our friends, from our accomplishments in the world, or from our the gifts we give or receive around this time of year? And I think that if my self-esteem is based on things that are uh, frivolous or impermanent, you know, then I'm on shaky ground. If I, if I notice it when I don't feel well, for example, that's not a good time to look at my, at my life. Uh, so um, if, I, if I am sort of from day to day trying to figure out how I measure up, uh, I'm very likely to revert to old patterns of of anger and resentment, especially if I find myself, you know, comparing myself to others. Um, I love this little book. I dug this up my bookshelf, The Underachiever's Manifesto, <laughs> The Guide to Accomplishing Little and Feeling Great. <laughs> and I, I love this book. It's, a, it's by uh, Ray Bennett, who's a, a doctor. So clearly he has achieved something. Uh, and it's very funny. And, and I think a very Buddhist book, although he doesn't say that. Um, in terms of finding our self-worth through our accomplishments, uh, Dr. Bennett really shoots that one down. You know, he says, mediocrity is the key to happiness. Mm -hmm. He says, six billion people, there are six billion people in the world and only a tiny fraction of them know anything or care anything about you. Mm -hmm. And he says, this should be sort of comforting to us. You know, <laughs> your success and failure matter to hardly anyone. And the sooner you realize this, the sooner you can get on with underachieving. <laughs> Think globally, underachieve locally. Uh, he points out that even friends and family may be less thrilled by your success and less affected by your failure than you, you might imagine. So he, he recommends, let us all join hands and do less together. And then maybe let's take a nap. Um, so he points out that our, you know, our infatu infatuation with achievement starts very early. I'm looking at Grisha because, you know, as teachers, we um, we grew up with our 
you know, gold stars and the grade book and all that. I don't know if you do that in kindergarten, but uh, uh, the trophies for sporting events and being punished for bad behavior. Um, this just popped in my mind. When I was in kindergarten, I was in love with Stevie Weirich and I would chase him around the room and try to kiss him. And so my, my kindergarten teacher made me sit in the bad chair. It was over against the wall. I didn't face the wall, but it was like, just like this, the bad chair. And uh, when she wasn't looking, I trade the bad chair. It was just like all the other chairs in the room. When she wasn't looking, I traded the bad chair for just a regular chair. <laughs> and I sat there and she thinks I'm sitting in the bad chair, but I'm sitting in a regular chair. <laughs> you know, so this this starts very early, the rewards and punishments, uh, things that come to us from the outside, you know, telling us whether we're worthy or not. I worked in education and there's a lot of uh, research about the value of intrinsic as opposed to extrinsic uh, uh, reward. So extrinsic, extrinsic, you know, comes from the outside. Intrinsic reward is that satisfaction we feel when we look within and, and know we've tried our best, you know, even if we fail that we put our effort out there. For many years on the wall of my classroom in gold letters, it said, in effort, there is joy, which is a quote from uh, uh, Vincente Esteban, a Spanish artist, in effort, there is joy. And I wanted my third graders to know that there, there's satisfaction and joy just in putting yourself out there, just in trying, just in making an effort of working to achieve something, even if we fall short of our goals. And it's only through that effort that we do progress at all. And I'm really glad that now in education, there's a lot of thought about a growth mindset. You know, So we teach kids to say, instead of saying, I can't do that, we teach them to say, I can't do that yet. You know, or if I can't do that, what do I need to do in order to learn how to do that? A lot of children just think you're either good at something or you're not. If somebody is good at math, they think, well, that person's just good at math and I'm not. And they need to learn that with effort. And, and for me, often children with learning differences work a lot harder and achieve a lot more than a, a very gifted student that can do everything with one hand tied behind their back you know, and doesn't try very hard. Um, and in Buddhism, one of the key touchstones, one of, part of the Noble Eightfold Path is right effort, right effort. When someone asked Suzuki Roshi, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, where I practice, um, what is right effort? He said, it's getting up when the bell rings. Now he was talking about monastic practice where at some ungodly hour in the morning, <laughs> someone runs up and down the hallways, you know, ringing a bell. Um, but we can apply this to our everyday lives, you know, when the alarm clock rings to just get up, get up and get ready to pour ourselves into our lives. The satisfaction we can feel when we really turn towards something we're passionate about, something we love, something we can dedicate our effort to. Um, this is very different than measuring ourselves through the eyes of other people. You know, we might find ourselves kind of looking at ourselves through the eyes of other people staring at us. So this is showing up for our own lives, getting up when the bell rings and li living our true lives. I think if we're making an enormous effort to try to impress our friends, maybe we need you know, better friends. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Bennett reminds us that, that striving itself is a form of suffering. Striving itself, you know, the Buddha said life is suffering striving itself, always driving ourselves to do more and be more and get more, you know, is a form of suffering. And he, he says, to seek perfection is to be cursed, to find fault in the perfectly adequate, enjoyable, or just plain good. Its pursuit is the drying mania of the overachiever. You know, why does it always have to be better and better and more, you know? Um, he also points out that 96% of our genetic information is identical to chimpanzees. So even the very best and brightest among us are very close to chimps, right? So um, he also says, biologically speaking, bacteria is wildly successful and they don't seem to work too hard at it. <laughs> I came across a wonderful quote by Robert Louis Stevenson. Our business in life is not to succeed but to continue to fail in good spirits. 
um, you know, I think people love us not because we're perfect, uh, but because of our vulnerabilities and our flaws and our idiosyncrasies. I I actually love going to memorial services uh, because I, you hear so much about a person that you didn't know. And a lot of what we talk about is their little foibles and the things that they said and the things that made us laugh, you know. Um, this is why people love us. Um, the author of the Underachievers Manifesto, you know, he was a, a medical doctor and a self-described, oh, oh, he calls himself a, a recovering overachiever. Uh, so clearly he's achieved something and I'm sure he would agree that there is satisfaction and joy in knowing that we've done our best, you know, no matter how it turned out, that we've worked to put our life and our relationships with others in order, and that we found something meaningful within ourselves to offer to the world, something that comes through us as an offering, you know. Sitting practice and practicing with other people, I think, help, help us to know ourselves more deeply. And the reflections and activities that we do in practice help us learn how to live in such a way that in quiet moments, we can remind ourselves that we've, we've tried to be true to ourselves. We've tried to be true to the people we love. We've made our best effort. We've fallen down and we've gotten back up um, to do what is right, to speak the truth. And at the same time, I don't think we need to to be too harsh with ourselves. I'm a little disappointed that I'm sopping wet, you know, from my water bottle uh, leaking in my bag. Uh, but this little voice in my head says, oh, honey, you're still doing it, you know. <laughs> um, we're all aware of how we fall short, but that doesn't, you know, mean that we need to give up or to live in a constant state of shame or guilt. So if we get the feeling, if when I get the feeling I'm standing next to myself with a clipboard and a checklist, you know, I like to shift that feeling and come back within myself and cultivate a kind of inner love and witness that's always there for me. That um, I would call it unconditional love for myself, you know. I don't know if I've ever told you how you really tell what unconditional love is, but if you really wanna know, open up your trunk and put your spouse and your dog in the trunk and close the door and then drive around for a little while. And when you open the trunk, just see which one of them is glad to see you. <laughs> and that is unconditional love. <laughs> I'm not sure if we can really realistically expect truly unconditional love from anyone but our dog. Um, here's a beautiful poem by Antonio Machado. Last night, as I was sleeping, I dreamt marvelous error that I had a beehive here inside my heart and that the golden bees were making white combs and sweet honey from my old failures. I'd like to tell you a story uh, about my monastic training, but I need to give you a little background first. Um, I grew up, I always wanted to be an actress and I, I was in community theater as a kid. Um, I was, was often a teenager in the, you know, play in Lafayette and um, major, uh, a lot of plays in, in high school and I majored in drama in college. And um, there was always this part of me that liked to be up on stage and hear the applause. And also, especially one of my earliest, I think a wholesome addiction to get up on stage and be someone else, you know, and enter some other world. I love that. Well, there was this boy in my class who was very dramatic and very emotional, didn't always get along well with everybody. He was the youngest person in our school to come out as gay and um, very touching. I took him aside one day and I said, you know, you're, you're so dramatic. You're so emotional. You might really enjoy theater. I told him, you know, I always was in plays growing up. I love to be on stage majored in drama, always wanted to be an actress. And I think you might really enjoy that world. And he looks at me and goes, so Laura, what made you abandon your dreams? <laughs> and I said, well, there's enough drama in third grade for me, you know. 
Uh, but that part of me that that likes to perform, and actually that came in handy as a third grade teacher, teaching kids, you know, you perform, you you're uh it's a it's it's a wonderful uh place to bring our full selves. Um but I lived for a few years at Tassar Zen Mount, Mountain Center, as one said, and then I returned there for 10 years during the summertime. I would teach during the school year and then go to Tassar during the summer to cook for the guests. When I was a pretty new student there, I found out we were going to have a mid-practice period celebration. In the middle, practice period is three months, and it begins with a seven-day meditation and ends with a seven-day meditation with one-day meditations in between. Very intensive time. So in the middle of that three months, this comes to us from Japan. There'd be a celebration, a skit night. And, uh, you know, in, in, part of the tradition is to make fun of the Roshi and the Abbot. Um, so I was really looking forward to this. So I spent many periods of Zazen writing a skit for skit night. And um, I would sit there and just be laughing in my seat. You know, I called it the Wizard of Zaz. And, uh, <laughs> And our, our teacher at the time, Richard Baker, was quite a dramatic fellow who got in a lot of trouble and went elsewhere. But uh, <laughs> um, it was sort of based on The Wizard of Oz. And I was, of course, Dorothy, because if you write the play, you can be the star. And it was a musical comedy. And I cast different people in different roles. And it was great. And people loved it. Oh, my God. They clapped. They shouted. They laughed. I was in seventh heaven. But I was a show ten that night. So, so at the end of the evening, there's this huge uh, brass bell that we would ring over and over and over again as people got ready for bed and went to bed. It's a beautiful haunting sound. So I was out there with my hair in braids and I don't know where I got this check dress out of the Goodwill, I think, and my little red shoes on it. Well, I have big feet actually, but I was ringing that bell and tears were just streaming down my face because I had realized that all of that planning and all of that fun and all of that bringing people together to do this play and the applause and the laughter, it all came from me wanting to fill this empty place inside myself that I'd always filled with applause and admiration and approval from other people. And the next day, I very rarely took time off from the Zendo, but I, I told the um, Shuso, the head student, that I was gonna just stay in my cabin that day and I kind of came to terms of, to this with this, and I decided I don't want to get up there and perform anymore from that place. I want to practice and um, come to a point in my life where I can do something like that from, with joy as an offering to the world, and that that any talent I might have been given doesn't belong to me. It's it's a result of everybody I've known and the people I've loved and the experiences I've had the conditions that I've lived, you know, all of that flows through me. And so um, I didn't want to, uh, to be that hungry, hungry person on stage anymore. And to stop looking outside of myself for, for that unconditional love, you know. Um, so where, where do we get our self-worth, you know, can we, created out of thin air, or can we just remind ourselves that we are enough, you know, that we do enough, and that there are people that love us just exactly the way we are. I, you know, I love, Suzuki Roshi died a couple of years before I came to Zen Center, but I've heard so many wonderful stories, things that he said. And one thing that he said was, um, you're perfect just the way you are, but that doesn't mean you can't stand a little improvement. <laughs> So I think if we can keep both of those in mind, we're in good shape. Uh, now, if you'll indulge me a little bit longer, I'm very happy to say that my book, Buddhist Stories for Kids, is coming out on December 9th. And these are Jataka tales, uh, based on Jataka tales. I, I read up over 100, there's 500 Jataka tales, which are the birth stories of the Buddha. You know, it's said that he was reincarnated as many different animals and people before he was born as the Buddha. And um, so I read a lots and lots of those stories and I chose 10 that I thought I could rewrite with kids in mind. For one thing, all the characters were male originally. So I wanted to play with gender and species and plots to kind of bring these to life for kids. 
And so if you'll allow me, I want to read you one of these stories, because I think this has to do with our self-worth and where it comes from. And this story, the, uh, the forest owlet saves the mahogany tree, I've dedicated to my Buddhist teacher, Linda Cutts, because she loves owls. And this book was illustrated by um, Sonali Zora, who is a Bangladeshi artist. And I'm so touched, I never met her. Shambhala found her to illustrate this book. And she read my stories so carefully and, and brought them to life so beautifully. So I'm gonna share this story with you. Long ago in another place in time, there lived a family of forest owlets in a great mahogany tree, a mother, a father, and their young one. Young owlet happened to be alone in the nest one day while his mother and father were out hunting for food. He hadn't yet learned to fly, but he had the sharp eyes for which all owls are known. From his perch in the tree, high above the mahogany forest, he watched a herd of elephants moving about in a clearing on the forest floor. As the afternoon wore on, clouds began to bunch and tumble and rumble on the edge of the sky. As they sailed slowly overhead, Owlet felt a few drops of rain and shivered. Suddenly, a jagged arrow of lightning tore across the dark sky. Owlet fluttered in his nest, lifting his head high and turning all around the way owls can. He didn't see any sign of his parents returning. Where could they be, he wondered, looking this way and that. Another flash of lightning sizzled through the forest and ignited a fallen tree that lay on the ground. A wisp of smoke curled up and sparks scattered, catching dry leaves and shooting along the bark of the dead tree. Soon the flames were dancing from the tree, from tree to tree, slithering up the trunks to the canopy above. The elephants smelled the smoke, saw the flames, and fled to the wide river nearby. With their long trunks, the older elephants soothed the younger ones, calming them and spraying them with cool water. Only one small elephant stayed behind, shaking under the tree that Owlet was perched in. Owl felt afraid. Where were his parents? Then he thought about how they had cared for him, building their cozy nest and bringing him food to eat every day. They had always loved him and believed in him. He knew that if there was any way that they could be there with him, they would be. He closed his eyes and he asked his mother what to do. It was almost as if he could hear her soft words in his heart. My child, she told him, your father and I are stranded far away. We can't fly through the flames back to our nest. Your wings are strong now and ready to take flight. Stretch them and feel their strength. You must fly above the fire and save your young life. Owlet stood up and stretched his wings. To his surprise, he felt his wings rising up through the smoky air. Suddenly, pushing away from the nest with his claws, he took flight. Then he heard his father's voice in his heart. Your friends in the forest are frightened. Some of them are hiding in the trees and will surely die in the flames. Can you help them? And then Owlet heard the cries of the world. He heard the mother elephant crying, where's my daughter? He heard the voices of the insects and small animals crying, someone help us. He heard the mahogany trees crying, we trees are strong, but not as strong as fire. And then he heard the river crying, fire is strong, but not as strong as water. His, father wor word, his father's words and the cries of the forest gave Owlet strength and purpose. He flew down to the baby elephant who stood shivering below. He cried, run to the river. Water is stronger than fire. I can't, cried the little elephant. I'm too frightened. Can't you help me? Owlet knew what he had to do. He felt the strength in his wings and the power in his heart. His eyes glinted like silver as he flew to the river, swooping down, wetting his feathers and flying back to sprinkle drops on the baby elephant. Again and again, he returned to the river, though it seemed his task was hopeless. He could only sprinkle a few droplets at a time, first on the baby elephant, then on the raging fire itself. He swooped and swirled through the smoke and the sparks, shedding tiny droplets on his home, the forest. They fell like tears from his wings and winked through the air to the trees below. The fire licked the leaves and threatened Owlet, but he carried on, determined to save the trees and the animals of the forest. The clouds in the sky looked down at Owlet, amazed at the bravery of the little bird. Over and over, Owlet returned to the river, bathing his feathers in the water, circling back to the fire, 
to scatter drops on the roaring flames and the frightened baby elephant. The clouds above were so moved by Owlet's bravery that they started to cry. The fire was so afraid of Owlet's strength and courage that it started to run away. The rain came down in cooling sheets, but Owlet continued to fight the flames himself. The rain poured down from the crowd, clouds, bathing the baby elephant, who shook herself and trotted down to the river to find her mother. Brave Owlet never gave up but continued to wet his wings and sprinkle water on the fading fire down below. Finally, the fire died and there was peace in the forest again. Exhausted, Owlet returned to his nest, which had been unharmed by the flames. The woods were cool and green, with raindrops dripping from the mahogany trees to the steaming earth below. Dark scars marked some of the trees where the fire had raged. Down at the river, the little elephant flapped her ears with joy as her mother sprayed her with cool water. Catching his breath, Owlet saw his father and mother against the gray sky gliding back to him, their faces shining with pride at what their child had done. From then on, the little forest Owlet, who would one day be reborn as the Buddha, knew that everyone can make a difference. Each little difference can add up to a big change in the world. And here's the Owlet and the baby elephant. <laughs> So uh, those of us in recovery uh, had to find out that in order to rebuild our self-esteem, we had to do esteemable acts. And that's a hidden message in that story. So thank you so much for your kind attention. And uh, I'd love to hear from you what might have come up for you as, as we've been here this morning about uh, where we get our worth or what's coming up for you around the holidays so the floor is open and i don't know if people on zoom are able to also uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ask, ask questions there Yes. Uh, thanks for your talk today, Laura. That was great. Something that came to my mind was this little quote uh, We're human beings, not human doings. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I say that to friends and say it to myself because our self esteem is based on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you kind of want to, especially where the, where the world is right now, what can I do? What can I do? And it's like maybe not do anything. And then you get into guilt. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, where's the fine line between a human being and a human doing? Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you talk about the state the world is in right now, there can be a sense of overwhelm of what can mm -hmm. I as one person do? And another thing that Suzuki she said was shine one corner of the world. So for me, that corner was my third grade classroom. But, um, you know, just smiling at someone on the street or helping, holding a door for someone or visiting someone who's sick or asking for forgiveness for someone you might have harmed. You know, all these little things are like, it's like the little owl sprinkling water on the fire. It doesn't seem like much, but um, if all of us do a little bit, it adds up to a lot. Um, there's so many places, our, our energies are very divided right now, I think. And then, of course, coming into the holidays, we can become way too busy and sort of lose track of what uh, this time of year can be about, which can be about coming, kind of coming within and looking back on the year and looking ahead and being with people we love. So um, it uh, takes some reflection to figure out where those lines are, I think. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. One uh, thing that came to mind when you were talking about being a teacher in uh, school, I remember um, sitting in uh, Sunday school, I think it was probably about eight or nine years old. And um, I'd always tried to be a really good boy, like my mother told me I should be. And sitting in Sunday school, I realized how fucking bored I was 
I decided at that point it would be so much more interesting to be a troublemaker and be a good boy. And I don't know if that was me noticing who I was or me making a decision to be that. Mm -hmm. But ever since then, I've sort of been a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always like the troublemakers in my class. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, Jeff. Hey, thank you for a great talk. I reminded of the the happiness studies mm -hmm. and the findings about the Danish and <laughs> how they're content with being average. It's okay to be, you know, in with the pack or mm -hmm. right size, as we call it, mm -hmm. in, in the rooms. It's uh. It's just mind boggling <laughs> in this culture. How did you find out about the Danish? Um, just in my news feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a wonderful movie called um, Happy by Rocco Balik. Mm -hmm. And he studied 12 different countries and their happiness quotient. And about the Danish, what he found out was they do co housing in Denmark. So that it'll be a kind of communal situation where people have their own living space, but it's older people and younger people living together, single people and families. Everyone, this is what a monastery is like, actually. Everyone takes turn cooking and cleaning up. Um, the older people or people who never had children get the benefit of being around kids. And they have a very high happiness quotient in their country. And... Um, I'm hesitating to bring this up, but I don't know if you realize that the suicide country, the suicide rate in our country mm. is double the murder rate. Double. Really? Yeah. Now, why is that? You know, mm -hmm. that should be front page news. That's a that's a huge, of course, there's these shootings every single day. But um that should be a priority to 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 come to grips with that. And I wonder if it has to do with the isolation that Americans feel and that individualism and that on some people's parts an inability to welcome in the diversity that makes our country what it is, you know? It's a very troubling statistic. Sorry. <laughs> but um, I think it's worth considering, you know? Yeah. yeah. And looking at other countries and how do they live? Yeah. yeah. Like Bhutan and Gross National Happy. <laughs> Say something about that. Just that that's their emphasis. The mm -hmm. king uh, decided that that was what was most important mm -hmm. was to cultivate happiness. Yeah. And in, in the, the, his people. And uh, so they, of course, do a lot of Buddhist practices, mm -hmm. and here you can um, emphasize probably more average performance, but just. Mm -hmm. In Bhutan, they, they were going to flood the valley uh, for uh, water purposes, but they did a study and figured out it would have caused much, caused much more suffering to relocate all those people and destroy all those houses and the culture that was there. It would be much more devastating than just to figure out another way to deal with the problem because of their idea of this happiness, the gross national happiness quotient. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's so many things that I want to say because well, I had enough things to say before now because of what you said. I mean, <laughs> don't think about Bhutan when you think about, you know, what is there, what metric do their legislative people use when they're trying to decide whether a law is like a good thing to do? Well, it's going to make people happy when you compare <laughs> to the discussion you want. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I really wanted to, in order to speak to what you presented, it was. And, and and is reflected in your book. It's it, it's so lovely this 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 gentleness and wholeness that that we can only get by reminding ourselves that a lot of the expectations that we grow up with that make us so tense. I mean, how many times have I heard myself say that to myself? And I think about all the mornings that I have to get up and put myself in like a cold shower. I can get back into my body and remember that no, you know. Let go of those expectations. You can remember to be who you're supposed to be. Like that will allow, right? <laughs> and all you have to do is that. And if we can just, and it's because 
of all those expectations, if we had the sense of separation and we missed all the community, if we just remember to gently forgive ourselves, be who we're supposed to be, and embrace others for the same thing. Yeah. And I thank you for reminding me of that. Well, thank you for that, highlighting that idea of coming back to our humanity. And uh, I think when we can do that for ourselves, we're more able to do it for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Uh, this talk really made me think about a lot of stuff. Um, and I realized how much I set my satisfaction with myself is related to my work. Mm. Um, and I've had real trouble at work on years. I got fired, I quit. Um, you know, I never made enough money, I thought. Um, and so it's like, you know, the saying, it's only a job. I say that, but I don't really, <laughs> you know, necessarily believe it. Um, and I'm having an extremely tough time now. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's really useful for me to just reflect on that mm -hmm. and think about how I can let go of some of that. Yeah. Are you hard on yourself? Oh, <laughs> I'm hard on myself about everything um, in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's why I, I, I got a kick out of this book, The Underachievers Manifesto, and taking pleasure in the merely adequate. <laughs> I just love that idea. There's, um, so there is a question in the Zoom chat. Uh, what is the title of the book again? My book or the? I think your book, uh, but Francis can go for um... Well, I'll show both of them. Buddha Stories for Kids, available widely, pre order on Amazon, coming out December 9th. Uh, it's, but it's from Shambhala Publications and should be in local bookstores too, which we want to we wanna go to. And The Underachievers Manifesto by Ray Bennett, MD. Very nice little handbook here. Kind of wet right now. <laughs> I think it'll survive. So I and I also wanted to um, well thank you for your talk. And I I, I wanted to go back to um, that moment in Tassahara you described. Mm -hmm. um, it really touched me because I felt that so many times. Well, I I did a PhD before uh, coming to San Francisco, and like being like having to give talks and think about like how like my paper would be perceived by the academic community. I was always in my head. And um, even though I enjoyed a lot working on the research projects that I was working on, I was so caught up on that, that it felt really heavy. Mm -hmm. And I remember my, my teacher back then, she would ask me to focus on helping others instead of um, how I'm gonna be perceived. But I think of what she said, I'm thinking about how what I'm saying is just the result of the entire universe, really, right? Um, that almost, I mean, I, I heard that point several times before, but it touched me to a point that, you know, I always had a little bit of trouble with the rebirth thing in Buddhism, but it's not that different than evolution. And, and in the sense that like, yeah, like what, what my life is the result of so many other lives, right? Um, and that really came to my heart when I said that. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Juan. You know, that what you're talking about is the essence of what in Buddhism we call emptiness. And emptiness isn't a kind of bleak landscape. It means that, that I don't exist for a nanosecond without all of you and the carpenter that built this beautiful floor and the trees that give us our oxygen. You know, this emptiness is actually the, the realization of our interconnectedness with all things. And uh, we, we can hold ourselves more lightly when we realize that, that rather than having the world on our shoulders, you know, it's flowing through us constantly. Um, and we're not alone. I, I love sitting in the presence of other people because it feels like we're alone together in a way. You know, our, our uniqueness is here, our individuality. Each of us is like a museum that exists nowhere else in the world. And yet we wouldn't exist without each other. And, you know, you're all in my eyes right now and I'm in your ears and, and that's, that's very comforting, I think. 
Um, I, I've been joking that I've retired from self improvement. <laughs> uh, you know, this is this is what you see is what you get. But it doesn't mean that I'm, I mean, I just wrote, I've just written three books, you know, over the last three years. And um, it, it's a different, but they're coming from a different place in me of, hey, I taught kids all those years. What can I give back to children? You know, how can I still be connected with children? So, you know, I'm looking forward to reading this book to kids in classrooms and libraries. And, and um, I love to think I taught kids for 35 years. So some of them have children now. And to think of my former students reading my books to their children is, is that interconnectedness, you know, and in, in, uh, I wouldn't be who I am without this 700 kids I taught over 35 years. So um, that's a real joy to consider that. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, so much. Um, please come read the book my children I love <laughs> yeah I love and thank you for all the ideas that you presented today and um I, you know the owl droplets the owlet droplets really stick with me because um it feels what I can do every day it feels so insignificant you know like I was uh dropping my ballot into the ballot box and being like what the hell is this gonna do you know it's like, it's like one flip of that owl's wing you know and um but I, I see that every day like the world is just feels you know in total distress and uh and like what is sitting on the cushion gonna do what is this what is this uh my morning practice going to do and then uh I have a student right now who's um you know really struggling and uh his uncle was just murdered in front of his apartment last week and he comes to school with you know nothing without his folder and you know how there's, there's kids that just aren't getting right support and i sit with him every day for 12 minutes i have to set the timer in a small group you know to help him with his abcs and i think like well what is that going to do in his life of distress and you know so we don't know i guess is the answer but and it's just a good reminder to keep <laughs> putting the droplets out there and hope that it makes a difference yeah. in some way or somehow. We don't know. We don't know, you know, how we affect others. And when you when you mention your student, I think of one of my kids, my first year of teaching who was making my life a living hell. And uh, I realized I had to sit with him and feel his pain and look him in the eye and I put my hand on his heart. And we breathed together. And three years ago, he invited me to his wedding. Mm -hmm. He found me, you know, he looked for me online. And, and I, that was so gratifying to me. And I was, uh, it was a big African-American women wedding. And my partner, David, and I were, were just a handful of white folks there. And everybody, you know, I think everybody should be in that situation of being, feeling what that's like to be in the minority. And when people found out I had been Terrell's third grade teacher, oh my God, you would have thought I was a rock star. You know? <laughs> and it, it was so touching to me. And the thing is, Grisha, that we, I knew, I, I was told on that day what an impact I'd had on his life. And his wife, especially, his young wife, especially expressed that. But what is a reminder when something like that happens is, there are many other ways we've affected other people positively that we'll never even know about. And we know that because we can think of times when people touched us or reached out a hand. They may not even remember doing it, but we remember at a low point, someone reached out to us. So um, shine one corner of the world. I really, I love that expression. Yeah. I don't know how we're doing on time. Just about yeah, we'll have time for a couple more questions. Um, I see a hand raised in Zoom, but I don't know if that was in Francis or there's someone else. Well, I'm sorry, was that a question? Oh no, I was just like I was asking people from oh. Zoom if they had a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hey, this is uh, Tom on Zoom. I don't know, uh, can Laura hear me? Yes. Hey, Laura, thanks for being back with us again. It's always a joy to have you. Um, 
you know, since you come from a background of teaching young children, um, I wanted to ask you a question. So, you know, this idea that we get our sense of self-worth from our accomplishments and performance and things like that, I think is instilled at a very young age. I know for me, if I got a gold star on my vocabulary test, I'd bring it home and I'd get, you know, a quarter or money or something. And so that started this cycle of, you know, being rewarded and getting a sense of self-worth from performance. Um, and then we hear the opposite opinion um, or viewpoint, like nowadays with Gen Z and millennials, they feel entitled even though they haven't done anything. So they don't feel they have to accomplish before they deserve the world. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we strike a balance? Like, because, you know, religions teach unconditional love or preach, they preach unconditional love, but then we teach, you have to accomplish to, you know, have a sense of worth in our society. So how do we strike a balance between like in a secular setting, in a school setting, to encourage um, a sense of self-worth that's independent of, you know, accomplishment, but also helping them to have a sense that they can um, achieve things in life? Well, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think you use the word that's needed, which is balance. It's so funny talking to that thing, um, <laughs> which is balance. And um, I think school has to be so many things for kids. It has to be a joyful time when they can just play and be themselves. There have to be opportunities for kids to find out. You know, I, I took this kid aside once in the middle of the year and I said, you know, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen your best work. And he looked around and said, nobody has. <laughs> and what I realized was he knew that if he showed me his best work, if he really tried, really put himself out there, I would be expecting that from him. And, at the, and I said, I just want you to know what it feels like to push yourself a little farther towards what you're really capable of. And at the end of the year, he said, came to me, said, I know now what it is to do my best work. So, um, Schools should not be, you know, these heavy taskmasters with these standardized tests that are shoved down kids' throats and, you know, um, race to the top was it was the mantra of education a few years ago. Race to the top? That's ridiculous, you know. On the other hand, um, kids sh shouldn't be praised and lauded just for fogging a mirror, you know. They, <laughs> they should get, <laughs> they should get the the satisfaction of really, really, uh, uh, really trying, really trying hard and seeing what that feels like. And it does require balance, you know? Um, but I, I think what it takes is a, a teacher that can look at kids and meet them heart to heart and make them feel seen and recognized. I know one thing for sure, that if a child in a classroom doesn't feel seen, doesn't feel heard, doesn't feel recognized, they're gonna be a problem. You know, we have to see and feel and hear these kids and, and make them feel welcome and loved. And then learning can happen, you know. If kids are frightened, they're not learning. They're in their fight or flight mode. So it's it, this is a huge question and I don't think we've addressed it very well as a nation. You know, our kids are, uh, COVID has had a very profound effect on kids learning, so. Um, there's no simple answer to that question, but it's one I ask myself every day. You know, I'll tell you one thing, which is that I had come from a monastic setting and, and then got my teaching credential and was in the classroom. And gradually over the years now, mindfulness has come into the classroom. And before that happened, I always had a bell in my room, like our bell. And I would tell the kids, I'm going to ring this bell now. And I want you to just sit and just be yourself. I, I said, all day long, you're being asked to perform, to accomplish something, to learn something, to get better at math, to learn something by heart, to play an instrument. Just feel your breath coming in and out of your body and just see what that feels like. And kids were very silly about it at first. They're embarrassed. And then they really love it. They love silence and that just a, a little bit of an introduction to following your breath and just having a moment of just being who you are without anything expected of you. 
And I think that's that movement, which is now in lots and lots of classrooms. And, you know, it's presented in a secular way, not in a Buddhist way, but uh, that, that will have an effect on kids. And it's happening all across the country. Can you imagine what these people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th, what they might have been like if they had been seen and heard and loved and had been loved for who they were? Um, I wonder about that. If I can make a really quick comment, um, the thing about race to the top, mm -hmm. everybody can't be at the top. <laughs> and so the 98% that aren't, you know, if they feel badly, you know, they're trying. And um, it's just like Curry and Companion, where they said all the kids are above that. <laughs> yeah. Which is not. Yeah. Well, and kids have to learn, the kids, it's wonderful when kids learn that I might not be great at math, but I'm a wonderful basketball player or I, I can't, my handwriting's terrible, but I can dance ballet, you know, that everyone has something to offer. And to find, for a child to find what that thing is they love. Um, you know, at the end of my year in third grade, I'd have everybody teach the rest of the class something. And by the end of the third, third grade, they could get up and talk for half an hour about how to be a rabbi or how to tie flies for fly fishing or, you know, and you know, what's really wonderful is a, a number of those kids have come back they found careers in the thing they taught us in third grade, a filmmaker, a jazz pianist, a rabbi, you know? And so when kids can find a passion very early in life and that that's their thing, you know, that can be tremendously encouraging for them. That's their thing. That's part of who they are, you know? Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I always have fun with you guys.